everyone, and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some fantastic videos to show you from all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. What we'll do today is we'll show you the latest and greatest that our guides have been seeing out in the field in Grand Teton National Park and the National Elk Refuge, as well as Yellowstone National Park. Then you'll have a chance to win our trivia question of the week. Lastly, I will be going ahead and answering your questions here live. So if you've got a question that's wildlife biology or national park or Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and the like related, go ahead and ask me in the comments section and I'll see if I can't get you all some answers. Joining us in the comments this week is our EcoTours naturalist, Maddie. So definitely say hi to Maddie, everybody, and let us know where you're watching from. To start, from, to start with this week, let's talk about moose and their winter habits. As we start to see snow and cooler temperatures in the valley, moose are moving from river bottoms and lakeside streamside habitat, sometimes called riparian habitat, up into the sagebrush flats of Jackson Hole and Grand Teton National Park. Bull moose, which typically in the summer would be solitary animals, will oftentimes kind of pair up into bachelor groups during the winter. These bachelor groups are not truly herds as the animals are still a solitary species, but they are using each other for companionship and utilizing a, the same food resource, which is antelope bitterbrush. It grows in and amongst the sagebrush. You can see the moose here eating some of that. These males will form great bonds with each other, and some will actually end up hanging out with the same males year after year, winter after winter, and others will form new bonds every year. Some of these bachelor groups actually end up getting to be pretty large in size. When I was out last evening with guests, I actually ran into a group of five bulls hanging out together on the sage flats. That's relatively unusual. Most of the groups are gonna number more in the two or three. But because of these groupings, it's not uncommon for us to be able to have an opportunity to see quite a few moose in a relatively short period of time in the winter months in Jackson Hole. These two bulls have been hanging out quite a lot together this winter. And one of my favorite things about this footage taken by naturalist Maddie is that you can actually see the frost forming on their backs. Moose are so well insulated for winter that very little heat actually escapes their body. And because that's the case, when it snows, it oftentimes will just pile up on their backs because the, the body heat from us, if you put your arm out in the snow, the snow would instantly melt on your arm. But for a moose, they actually have so little heat coming out that the snow can just build up. Tyler has been spending time with another bachelor group. Most of the bulls in this group have slightly smaller antler sizes, but there's actually more of them palling together up in the sagebrush flats. This particular group has been kind of fun to watch because they're pretty young and rowdy. Older moose with nothing to prove in life oftentimes can be pretty slow and sedate. It's the younger bulls that sometimes show the exciting action, chases, and play fights. And this group did not disappoint. Tyler and his guests have had quite a few opportunities to watch them doing their little mock battles over the last couple of weeks. I'll let Tyler put it best in this great view he and his guests had. Oh, oh, what's going what? on? There? So this is a little bit of a dominance display here. Wow. Yeah, so male ungulates will do that to each other and to females uh, to display dominance. Kind of like dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you get a chance to get out to Jackson Hole this winter or in the coming winters, we hope you will get up out on the sagebrush flats and get a chance to see some of these moose for yourself. It's a pretty once in a lifetime opportunity and something we have the joy to be able to see every day out here as Jackson Hole is one of the best moose watching locations in the world. So a big thanks to Maddie and Tyler for that great footage of moose from this week. Next, I thought it'd be good to give you an update on Grizzly Bear 399 and Grizzly Bear 610. Let's check in. I thought I'd give you all an update on our local grizzly bear population. Most of our grizzlies have gone into hibernation for the winter, but grizzly bear 610 and her two cubs were spotted by Elise this week, still out and about foraging for food resources. And then I went out uh, the next day and actually saw their tracks littering across the snow. 
For those of you wondering about Grizzly Bear 399 and her quadruplets, they are slowly making their way back towards Grand Teton National Park and all four cubs are doing really well. Now, of course, this footage was taken from inside a house from a cell phone. You always want to make sure you're keeping your distance from any grizzly bear. Maddie got this great footage of the family all together, kind of slowly making their way northward. So a good update from some of our favorite bears in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Grizzly Bear 399 is finally headed north. Hopefully she'll be headed up to her hibernatory den, although she could stay out for a little bit longer. And her daughter, Grizzly Bear 610, doing just fine with those two cubs of her own. All right, so next up, we've got a really big treat for you guys. Our Eco Tours naturalist, Josh, was up in Yellowstone and got some great up close and personal encounters with wolves, which is a very rare event. Hello, this is Josh Metton with Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures. I've got an exciting wolf update for you from the northern range of Yellowstone National Park. Last week, the Wapiti Lake Wolf Pack took a trip out of their territory in Yellowstone's interior, ending up near Tower Junction in Yellowstone's northern range. The Wapitis soon found themselves howling with the 35 member strong Junction Butte Pack, whose territory they were intruding upon. Intraspecies wolf-on-wolf conflict is the leading cause of death of wolves in Yellowstone, and the smaller Wapiti pack wisely decided to retreat, crossing the road right in front of us as they headed south. Close-up sightings like these ones are uncommon, but do happen if you are in the right place at the right time. However, since successful reintroduction over 25 years ago, wolves have been widely visible from afar, which is why we use Maven binoculars and spotting scopes on all of our tours of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. Late fall and winter are among the best times of year to view wolves in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for several reasons. First, by late fall, pups are old enough to rejoin and hunt with their packs, meaning there's more wolves moving across the landscape. Second, as snow piles up in the high country, Prey species, including elk, bison, deer, concentrate in the valley where they and wolves, as a result, are more visible. Poor forage conditions and winter weather weaken these prey species, making them more susceptible to hunting by wolves. Winter is the time of year to be a wolf, while summer is the time of year to be an elk. Third, in midwinter, around late January and February, the wolf mating season begins. Howling and interactions between packs increase as wolves coming of age make exploratory forays in search of mates. The opportunity to see wild wolves again in Yellowstone, and Grand Teton, and all across the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is a conservation success story that's been over 70 years in the making. In 1944, ecologist Aldo Leopold was among the first to argue in favor of wolves, stating, Probably every reasonable ecologist will agree that some of them should lie in the larger national parks and wilderness areas. For instance, the Yellowstone and the adjacent national forests. It's amazing to think that as 2020 comes to an end, we have now witnessed over a quarter century of wolves return to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, a truly wild landscape right here in the lower 48 states. Thanks for watching. This is Josh with Ego Tour Adventures, and we hope to see you in Grand Teton Yellowstone National Park soon. Thanks, Josh. Really, really fun stuff going up in Yellowstone National Park. So, although the park is closed to vehicle entry, over snow travel starts to open pretty darn soon. And we certainly look forward to that part of the annual winter season here in Jackson Hole. Now, we haven't heard from Sarah Ernst in a while, and she's got a great update on great gray owls. So let's check in with her. Hello, this is Sarah with EcoTour Adventures, and I'm standing in some very good great gray owl habitat here. They really like these nice open forests with a mixture of trees and grasses. We have been seeing a lot of great gray owls recently this fall, as the young owls have left their nest and the parents have left them to fend for themselves. The great gray owls we've been seeing are often juveniles. I want to talk a little bit about what the first few months of this owl's life was like. 
Like many owls, great grays can't build their own nests. They may use a raven or a hawk's nest or kind of find a little nook at the top of a broken down tree. We are often asked why Yellowstone and Grand Teton don't remove the unsightly dead trees in the parks. And one of the many answers to this question is to provide wildlife habitats, such as great gray owl nest sites. It was completely up to mom, who's larger than the male, to incubate the eggs in early spring while dad provides her food. While as many as five eggs might be laid, typically in this ecosystem we see two or three babies in the nest. The eggs that hatch first have a few days head start on their younger siblings and are usually fed first, which means the smaller, younger one will only survive if there is abundant food. After the young owls fledge in the summer, the male, and sometimes the female, will continue to feed them for several weeks to months while building their flying strength and learning how to hunt. By autumn, though, the parent birds have gone their own separate ways for the rest of the year, and the young birds are on their own. They're already full-grown, at least in their body, but not always their brain. They've got some learning to do. Our Yellowstone and Grand Teton owls will, will remain here to hunt as long as the snow levels are low, but they will typically migrate to areas with less snow as our long, snowy winter continues. Great grays are more likely to hunt during daylight hours. They are elusive and charismatic birds. They use both their sense of hearing and sight to find their prey, so it's pretty important to stay quiet and still if you are lucky enough to encounter this gray ghost of the woods. It can be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spend time with this awesome bird, and we encourage people to enjoy them at the experience, but noises and movements of people can stress and distract the bird. At Eco Tours, we always try to set a good example for the other wildlife viewers by remaining a respectful distance and staying quiet amongst these kings and queens of our northern forests. So, a big thanks as ever from our naturalist, Sarah Ernst. So, I've got a real treat in favor in story for you guys this week. We kind of were thinking everyone's all cooped up, particularly in areas where the COVID outbreak has become pretty darn severe in the last couple weeks. So we asked Tyler to take us on a virtual hike in Grand Teton National Park. Let's check it out. Hello everyone. Happy Wildlife Wednesday. My name is Tyler Greenlee and I'm going to take you on a virtual hike today. We're out here in, at Blacktail Ponds in Grand Teton National Park. I got my camera, my bear spray, and we're going to walk down the trail and see what animals and plants and other cool sightings we can find. Awesome. Let's head out. All right, guys, we're out here at Blacktail Ponds. Here's kind of a landscape shot of where we're at today. There's the Tetons in the background covered in snow and glaciers. We have a really unique habitat in front of us with willows, tall trees, and beaver ponds. This is a riparian zone. There's some mallards down there, and I'm sure some other smaller riparian critters like beavers and raccoons. There's my camera right there. If we look behind us, you can see it's dry sagebrush grassland. This forest only exists because of the Snake River down there. And then here's the muddy, snowy trail we're walking down today. I wore my tennis shoes, which might not have been the best plan. It's a little muddy out today. I'm gonna to have to bring my heavier, heavy duty boots next time. And we just came across our first animal sign. Let's check it out. All right, guys, here's that track. It's an older moose track. There's a little bit of some dry plants in front of it. You can see it's a little bit of an older track. It's sunken in. The edges are melting away. I would say this track is at least two days old. It's kind of hard to tell because the snow has been melting pretty quick, quickly recently. We've been having 60 degree weather. And so the tracks, they don't last as long in the snow as if it had, if, as if it were, if it, as if it were colder. Uh, when it is colder, the frost and, uh, and just the colder temperatures do preserve the tracks longer. Of course, if we do come across something that's super fresh, it'll be super crisp in the snow. Almost like if I put my fingers in the snow, see how sharp that is? That's how sharp 
a, a fresh track. Guys, we're kind of coming down this steep hill into these cottonwoods. I'm going to switch the camera over to show you kind of the trail. It's getting a little steep, so we'll have to see how this descent goes. Here's the area we're descending down into. The trail is right there. You can see we're entering an area with a lot of cottonwoods, and the reason these cottonwoods are growing here is because of this stream that flows through this area. It's currently dry, but in the spring when all the snow melts, it will it will come out of the hills. All this water will come out of the hills over there. That's Blacktail Butte, and that's where we get a lot of water runoff. So we've talked a lot about this being moose habitat, and we do have some more moose sign here. Let's check it out. As we are down here in kind of this thick vegetation, you can see you can't you can't really see very far in it and we're moving through here very slowly and carefully I'm actually glad to be talking loud because you never know when there's gonna be a large herbivore or even a bear down in this thick vegetation but the reason we stopped here is because we do have more animal sign we have more moose tracks and about a hundred meters behind us there's some deer tracks and then we also have moose scat. So these are moose pellets and we don't have to be grossed out by the scat because it's basically just digested vegetation. If it was carnivore scat, it's something we definitely wouldn't want to get close to. But herbivore scat is very clean and I can tell this is moose scat because it's almost like it has a wood chip consistency within the actual scat and then the and then at the tips of the scap, there's a little point, which is very typical of moose. And here is what the moose are eating. These are willow bushes, kind of these, these uh, branches here. This is actually looks to be choke cherry, which the moose would eat, but they're mainly after the willows. And so I can tell this is choke cherry because of the spines that are on it. While over here we have willow, genus name is Salix. It has this uh, yellowish uh, branch to it. Sometimes they appear red or even purple from a distance. And this is the primary diet of moose uh, during the winter and during the s and a big part of their diet during the summer as well. Guys, we are down in this river bottom and we have our first bear sign down here. So I'm gonna flip the camera around and I'll show you this bear sign. And I can tell it's bear because it's full of seeds. This is probably from them feeding largely on berries at this time of year. And I'm guessing this is black bear scat. And that's just based off of the size and the fact that it has so much berry seeds within it. Now the black bears at this time of year are probably already hibernating. And so the scat does look to be pretty old, probably at least two weeks old. Now what's really cool is that these seeds in the berry scat could actually turn into bushes. And so it's likely these are chokecherry or hawthorn berries. And hawthorn berries, when they're deposited like this, the scat will act as a nice fertilizer package for when these seeds germinate. Here are some more animal sign guys. This is a pocket gopher burrow. And so this is where the pocket gophers, which is a small fossorial rodent, fossorial meaning it lives underground almost its entire life. This is where that rodent pushes up all the dirt from its underground diggings. These rodents burrow like a mole their entire life and they feed on the roots of grass and tubers underground and the only time they come to the surface is to push up this dirt. When they do come to the surface that's when they're most vulnerable to hawks, owls, coyotes, and their other various predators. There is one animal that can actually dig out a pocket gopher and that is the American badger. The badger is actually fast enough to dig up pocket gophers while they're underground. Hey guys, just saw two more piles of bear scat about 20 meters behind us. But I just want to reiterate that whenever you're in the forest, especially in Wyoming, it's so important to actually carry bear spray. All right, guys, I'm going to head through these kind of thick bushes through here and I'll catch up with you in a sec. All right, guys, here's a progress update on our hike. We've gotten closer to the Tetons and we are now in the river valley, woohoo. And I can actually hear the Snake River up ahead.
Guys, we just arrived at the tri at this tributary to the Snake River. Really beautiful scenery here. And I have some more animal sign for you guys. And so if we look at the edge of the stream here, there's actually kind of a tunnel dug. And if we look back on the actual trail, it's caved in right at this point. And what this is, is this is a muskrat burrow. Now muskrat burrows, are used by many different animals. They're used by beavers, they can be used by mink, which is a type of weasel, and they can be used by river otters, all as denning sites. And so muskrats are really important along these areas. And here we have kind of a historic stream bed, which is known as an oxbow. And so this is probably where this tributary historically flowed into the Snake River. And these oxbows are really important habitat. You can often find lots of ducks. In fact, there's some ducks that just swam out. They're right over there, kind of middle of the stream. Oh, they're taking off flying towards us. They're gonna come up above the trees. There they go. And so these oxbows are great habitat for ducks. Uh, muskrats, mink, beavers, they hold a lot more vegetation and life. Fish like to be back in there. And so preserving these alluvial oxbows is really important for the ecology of these riparian areas. Awesome guys, we've arrived at the Snake River. Behind me is that tributary that we've been following. And this is where it meets with the main channel of the river. Now these rivers are carrying large amounts of sediment. And if we look behind me, you can see that sediment building up on the shore of the river. That sediment is really important. That's what all the willows, tall grass, all these big trees over here, you can kind of see in the camera now, are actually growing out of. This soil is much more rich in nutrients than the dry upland soil where we find the sagebrush and that dry native and sometimes invasive grass species. Um, and that's where we find obviously the pronghorn and the bison. Down in these habitats, we do have black bear, moose, tons of deer. I've been seeing tons of deer tracks down in here, which is pretty awesome. And unfortunately, I can't really tell if there are mule deer or white-tailed deer. We can only speculate. Because this is a riparian zone, I wanna say there's a high chance it's white-tailed deer just because they do prefer this lowland habitat with the river, the tall trees, and the alluvial soils. Now I'm gonna try and pan. We have some cabins behind us and then obviously the Tetons. So hey guys, so we stopped here along the trail because I found some really cool plant species. Uh, which I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to flip the camera around and show you some berries and then some really interesting plants that live down along the rivers in Grand Teton National Park. So, so here we have some rose hips, guys. And so this is actually wild rose. And uh, this is one of the edible plants that you can actually uh, consume out here and something that the settlers used to eat when they were in this area. It's super high in vitamin C and so if you're out here in the winter and uh, you're starving to death and you don't want to get scurvy, this is a very reliable source of vitamin C. Scurvy of course is the disease you get from vitamin C deficiency. You can eat these raw uh, they, they don't taste horrible. They're, they don't really taste like anything. The only downside is that they have a bunch of seeds inside of them. And so it's really better to kind of eat the fleshy part around those seeds. You can also turn these rose hips into tea, which is a kind of, which I, in my opinion is a better way to actually consume these berries, these wild fruits. Uh, that way you're not obviously eating those kind of waxy seeds so rose hips are known as angiosperms, which is the group of plants that makes the majority of the vegetation out here. That includes the cottonwood trees, the willows, the grasses. But here we have a much more ancestral species of plant. It's called horsetail. And I'm not gonna pluck it since we're in a national park, but I am going to show you it. So here is uh, horsetail, and uh, its scientific name is Equisetum, 
and horsetail in this area comes in a bunch of varieties. This is the single stock variety. It also comes in a, in a branching variety, which is fun to play with. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to actually uh, play with these plants like Lincoln Logs. Each one of these segments you can actually pull apart and uh, then you can stack them together uh, like Lincoln Logs. Uh, but this is an ancient plant that has existed on Earth for about 300 million years, I believe. So it's one of the oldest forms of life out here. And uh, is a plant that was around during the dinosaur age. A lot of dinosaurs did eat this plant. And, uh, and so what we're looking at right now is um, a living fossil. Hey guys, we're about halfway through our hike and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to anyone else who has joined us halfway through this hike. That's totally fine. Um, I just wanted to give myself another introduction. My name's Tyler Greenlee and welcome to Wildlife Wednesdays. We have a, a really beautiful view and of my camera, which I'll move out of the way real quick, of the, of the Tetons and this beautiful Snake River riparian zone behind us. We've stopped here along this tributary to show you something really special. This is behind me a big beaver dam. You can see how the beavers have used logs and sticks and large amounts of sediment to hold back this water. Now this is going to really help in the spring when we do have that spring flooding. All that water is going to be held back in these natural reservoirs that the beavers have built and the flooding is going to be less severe downstream. Now these dams serve another purpose. They also hold back tons of water during the driest times of the year, so that, which is uh, going to be great for the animals. It's great for people because we have this kind of natural water source that is stored behind us. Uh, the Snake River is the main water source for the town of Jackson. And so this water is going to naturally leave this dam over time and we have a lot of water stored back in there. And so beavers are really great for water preservation on the landscape. We actually have the Beaver Lodge right there, kind of behind me. Um, it's a big mound of logs and the Beaver Lodges are so strong, not even a black bear can break into them. And the beavers right now are likely in there. Beavers are highly nocturnal. I uh, tell guests on tour that they are basically walking hamburgers when outside of water. And so these beavers are oftentimes nocturnal just so that they can use the cover of darkness to stay safe. Uh, beavers um, are, they're stimulated to build dams by the sound of rushing water. And so I do see one little spot right here where the water is actually pouring over the edge of the dam. And so likely what will happen is the beavers will come in and patch that section when they hear that flowing water. We have another track here. This is a really good moose track. And if I kind of scan, you can see there's a couple moose tracks around here. And uh, here you can really see the anatomy of a moose track. You can see they have the cloven hooves right here, which are the main two toes on a moose foot. However, moose have four toes actually on their, on their legs. And so these are the main two toes. And then back here, you can see kind of a little dot right here. And so that's, a, that's the mark of a dew claw. And so moose do have two dew claws. If you think of like your pet dog, dogs, if they're not uh, declawed, some, uh, but if your dog does have a dew claw, uh, that's the same thing, similar to a moose, except moose have two of them. And so surprisingly, moose, deer, elk, they all have four toes. And in fact, most even toed ungulates, which are all the ungulates within Grand Teton National Park, actually have four toes versus horses, which are odd toed ungulates. They only have one toe and one hook. As we are getting close to the end of our hike, we're about to pop up on the Snake River. And uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of give you guys a species list of all the things we saw on this hike. And so I won't do the plants. <laughs> That's way too tedious. Um, but I will name the animals and the animal sign that we saw on our hike. So we saw uh, beaver dams. So beavers live here. We have muskrats. Northern pocket gophers, I'm pretty sure they're northern pocket gophers is the species that lives down here. Um, we also have uh, either 
uh, whitetail or mule deer or even potentially both down here. We saw their tracks. Uh, we also got black bear sign and moose sign as well as around 10 different species of bird including ravens, uh, passerines, and uh, a bunch of waterfowl. And so these riparian areas with these rivers, this thick vegetation are super important as far as uh, preserving and uh, conserving biodiversity and life on these landscapes. I just had two, oh there they go, kind of off near the backs of the trees. You can see their white tails waving. I have two white tailed deer running off into the trees and so I'm guessing the tracks of the deer we saw earlier were actually white tailed deer. And now I'm just gonna scan over to the right a little bit because there's also a moose right here and so here's a moose and those white tail are kind of looking back at that moose they're a little nervous and so here we have the two ungulates that we were tracking today on our hike i hope you guys have a wonderful wednesday and once again thank you so much for tuning in my name is tyler greenlee and have a wonderful wednesday So hopefully everybody enjoyed that. A little bit of a longer segment. So let me know in the comment section if you find these wildlife hikes fun. I really enjoyed that afternoon out with Tyler. And guys, I do a big reminder that we've got this really cool thing going on this week. Um, we're uh, previewing our Black Friday sale early. So if you'd like to go out on a tour or you wanna go on your own wildlife hike with Tyler, um, we've got this really, really good deal. We're offering 10% off all winter tours. So from January 1st to March 31st, and 10% off of our web store, which we'll get to in just a minute. Um, you wanna use this coupon code uh, ETA Black Friday 2020. If you're having a hard time remembering that, ETA just means Eco Tour Adventure. So ETA Black Friday 2020. And uh, we've had a bunch of folks taking advantage of this already. Um, orders for discounted trips have been flying in today. So if you think you might be visiting Jacksonville in the future, or you just want something fun from our store, uh, definitely take advantage of that. Now, speaking of that, of course, it is time for our trivia question of the week. Our featured item in the ETA store, because after all, the winner is going to receive a $10 gift card to our store is this awesome logo Steo Wilcox fleece made by Steo Clothing Company, which is based here in Jackson Hole. So if you want your very own logo ETA wear, Maddie will go ahead and put a uh, link up in the comment section for that. All right, so the way this works is we started our Eco Tour Adventures store during the first COVID closure as a way to pay for employee health insurance. Um, we wanted to make sure everybody was covered in the middle of a pandemic and through everybody's great purchases 100% of the proceeds are going towards our health insurance So we certainly appreciate you guys taking a look see if there's any Christmas presents or anything else you might like to have But if you want to go ahead and get ahead of the game and win this great $10 gift card All you have to do is answer our trivia question of the week correctly And then all the right answers will be put in a drawing and one name will be chosen to win that we'll go ahead and contact you so let's start with last week's question. And our uh, quiz master, Elise, has already awarded for this question. So you can answer in the comment section if you'd like, but it's not gonna gift you that gift card. Last week's question, and I use this great illustration of Theodore Roosevelt having a Thanksgiving truce from the Library of Commerce to illustrate it, which is what animal's diet is made up primarily of elk? And, uh, that animal is in that illustration there, sitting right next to the elk, side by side in their Thanksgiving truce. That, of course, is the gray wolf. The vast majority of their diet, so between 90 and 95% of their winter diet, and about 85 to 90% of their summer diet is composed of elk. A lot of misunderstandings about wolves, lots of incorrect folklore that goes back to the Middle Ages. Werewolves, anyone? Uh, but one of the big misconceptions is the vast majority of what they eat out there is elk. So great on that one. If you got that one correct, 
Good for you. You definitely know your wildlife trivia. Let me see if I can stump you for this week. So, okay, now this is the one you want to comment on to win your $10 gift card. And, of course, the question this week is, what mammal, Jackson Hole mammal, can eat sage? So go ahead and answer in the comment section what Jackson Hole mammal is actually capable of eating sage, which is our predominant major plant here in Jackson Hole. Other than, of course, um, lodgepole pine trees. You know, all of our valley floors are covered in sagebrush. There are a few birds that can eat sagebrush. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking what mammal. There's only one mammal that can actually get nutritional value out of sage. So go ahead and let me know in the comments section. I was curious as I was working on this today because this question does come to us from our Ecotours naturalist, Seth, who would have asked this, which is, do turkeys eat sage? Because sage grouse eat sage and ruffed grouse eat sage, and they're both fowl-like birds. We don't have turkey here. Uh, there are turkeys in other areas of the West where sage is, though. So I went ahead and I went on a search to look for it because it's Thanksgiving. And basically, long story short, nobody's quite sure. So maybe turkeys can eat sage? But the question is what mammal eats sage? So if you know the answer, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about that next week for sure. Uh, but in the meantime, see if you can't win our trivia question. In the meantime, I am here uh, to answer your questions live. So if you've got a question for me, uh, go ahead and write it in the comments section. I've got my iPad here. Um, so if you see me looking down, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, looking at your questions. Oh man, people are already Ooh, there's some correct answers on the trivia question, everybody. So let me go back to sort of the beginning here because there were some questions. First and foremost, I asked where everybody was joining us from. I think the furthest away was Pierre. Pierre is joining us from Alsace in France. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Uh, or Alsace? I think it's Alsace. Is that how I say it? I'm not sure. Pierre, you can correct my terrible, terrible pronunciation. But thank you so much. I think you are the furthest away today. Uh, I'm so excited that we have a Frenchman. What time is it there in France that you're watching us live? That's so cool. Thank you for joining us. And then Erin wanted to tell us that she's from Denver, but she's watching from Jackson Hole because she's going on a tour tomorrow. Erin, that's so cool. I'm so excited you're headed out. Really fun day to do it on Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great, great day. We've had such a good series of tours in the last couple days. So much stuff going on out there. So have a blast. We're so excited. Karen asks, do 399 and 610 den near each other? They do den near each other, but like not super near each other, which is to say I think 610 mimics where her mom dens because that's where when she was a cub, she denned with her mother. So she kind of dens nearby, but it can vary from year to year. Um, there, were, was a, there was a little period of time there uh, where we didn't know where 610 was for about two years. And she certainly wasn't denning in that location. But she seems to be denning sort of vaguely near her mother lately. Hopefully that answers that question. Let's see here. Carrie asks, just curious what the purpose of a dew claw is. Carrie, that's a really, really good question. So Tyler was talking a little bit about those vestigial hooves that you might see on ungulates like moose. Um, and he was comparing them a little bit to a dew claw that you might see on um, a canine or a feline, like a dog, for instance, may have a dew claw. Historically, it was thought that those were vestigial. So vestigial is just a scientific term that means something that was evolutionarily necessary in the past, but now is not evolutionarily necessary. So a really good example of something that um, could be vestigial would be um, the appendix in humans. Although we're finding there might be some things appendixes do, but you could certainly live without one. Um, or um, some other things that we have uh, segmented muscles in our abdomen, those six packs like Brad Pitt has, those are actually an evolutionary adaptation uh, made in mammals when they were still uh, bound to the oceans, the ancient seas. That goes back to when uh, we were fish-like life forms. We don't need segmented muscles. And in fact, that's not very beneficial for us because it can cause things like hernias. But all mammals today still have segmented muscles in their chest. So a dew claw could be vestigial, but there's some evidence that seems to suggest, at least in wolves and some dogs, that they actually do use it to grip things like bones um, 
or other things that they need a good, a good grip on. If you've got a dog who's got a dew claw that is not sort of flappy and has no muscle connective tissue, you might witness your dog doing something along those lines. So there might actually be a purpose of that. In the case of moose, why those two additional hooves are there, somewhat questionable, we don't really know. But once again, there's a suspicion um, of, of a vestigial origin. The other reason perhaps is that in, um, a more ancient time, there was a smaller set there that was allowing them to balance when they were running. And of course, moose don't necessarily uh, need to run at exceptionally high speeds anymore because rather than fleeing from predators, they fight predators. Uh, and so they've receded upwards where they're gonna be out of the way. So hopefully that answers your question. Let's see what else we've got here. Let's see here. Looks like people are liking the wildlife hikes, so we'll try and do more of those for sure. They're super fun out there looking for track and sign. One of my favorite things to do with guests, so we might as well do it virtually, right? Let's see here. <laughs> Karen says, I need the white and purple knitted hat with the bear. Karen, we'll ask if Elise can get some of those up for sure. But if you want, a great way to do it is you can go ahead and get one of those hats on our store. We have these really awesome knitted hats that I was talking about last week. And just dictate that you're looking for white and purple as a color. And I'm sure Elise will whip you right up because I didn't realize that my white and purple one wasn't one of the ones on offer. I think she just asked me what my two favorite colors were <laughs> and then made them. But um, yeah, if you haven't checked out Elise's uh, awesome, awesome knitted hats. Elise was the one who had the, the images of 610 this week. Let me know. Let's see here. <laughs> Robert says, okay, what mammal eats sage? You tell me. That's the question. Go ahead and take a guess, right? What's wrong with a guess? Worst case scenario, you're wrong. You don't get a $10 gift card. I'm trying to be a little harder, guys. Hopefully this was a slightly harder question. Free, free, feel free to weigh in to see if I did good or you want me to go back to something a little bit easier. But I think this is a good one. Good on Seth for coming up with that question this week. Don, you've asked me a really interesting one. Don asks, why were bullfrogs eradicated from the Kelly area a year or two ago? What problem did they pose? Don, that's really, really complicated. Uh, and the answer is we're not exactly sure. So for those of you guys not familiar with the local wildlife politics of Jackson Hole, Don's referring to a situation, um, there's a warm spring in Grand Teton National Park that was formed as part of the seismic activity that occurred in the Grovant Range um, that in part caused the Grovant slide in the Teton, I'm sorry, in the Grovant Range uh, throughout the 1920s and 30s. We had sort of increased seismic activity. Uh, there was a hot spring that was formed as part of that that maintains a temperature of 83 degrees year round. And over the years, several invasive species, animals that don't belong to the area have gone in there. Starting in the 1980s, people uh, dumped some goldfish and African cichlid fish probably from aquariums and fish tanks. My suspicion, the only reason I can think of that you would do that is you were moving and you couldn't take your fish with you. So you thought maybe that was a good place for them to live. I would have guessed with how severe our climate is here that tropical fish would not have done well. Uh, but in fact, they are alive and thriving in Kelly Warm Springs, which is a concern to the Park Service. They don't want those fish to make it all the way to the Snake River. And of course, the outflow of Kelly Warm Springs flows to the Grovant, which then does flow to the snake. They don't want invasive goldfish in the snake. I can understand that. Bullfrogs, we don't know exactly how they got there. Certainly not native. Maybe released pets. Same situation, somebody let their pet go there. They thought maybe that was a good place for them to survive. Bullfrogs certainly can outcompete other amphibians and they can transmit disease to other amphibians as well. Quite a few of our reptiles and amphibians are in perilous, perilous shape in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. A really good example of this would be the Northern Spotted Leopard Frog. Nobody's actually seen one in the Western Rocky Mountain states uh, for, let's see, a child handed one to a park ranger at the base of Jackson Lake Dam in 2001. 
And that's the last one that's been seen. So presumed extinct, but if they were anywhere left on the planet, they would be in Grand Teton National Park. Um, and so obviously we wanna do everything we can to try to preserve them. Um, if there are Northern Leopard spot, Spotted Frogs left, obviously things like sagebrush lizards and other animals like that that are um, really, really rare animals, they can certainly get diseases from invasive species like bullfrogs. So, the, the reasoning that was given, which is a valid good reasoning, I'm not here to inflict my opinion on you, but it is, was that the concern was that they could be vectors for disease and that if they continued to populate good habitat, that all of these reptiles and amphibians that were struggling in Grand Teton National Park were just gonna be in worse condition. Because they were isolated in Kelly Worm Springs, the Park Service sort of saw it as a way uh, to nip it in the bud before they started to spread out. My problem with that was that the bullfrogs had been there a long time. I remember bullfrogs being there when I was a little girl. Um, and I was born in 1982. So they haven't exactly been spreading rapidly, uh, nor have the goldfish, uh, nor have the African cichlids. And, and the simple reason for that is as soon as the water becomes cool and ice is over in the winter, uh, an African cichlid is certainly not gonna be able to travel in water above about 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Bullfrogs obviously are gonna struggle once they get out of those warm conditions too. So it was a little bit of an island of invasive species. It's actually very funny. If you go to the Grand Teton National Park website and you just go to like a species listing, when you get down to fish, there are about seven species of native fish in Grand Teton National Park. And then there's a listing of 29 fish underneath that with an asterisk. And it just says only present in Kelly Worm Springs because those are all those weird goldfish and African cichlids that they found. So the park went ahead last year and they applied a piscicide, which is just a, um, a killer of fish and oftentimes usually amphibians to the water in Kelly Worm Springs. The idea being it wouldn't kill plants or kill other things, but it would just kill the fish that were present. Um, I have no idea whether that was successful. In the past, piscicides have had mixed results on things like bullfrogs. So we'll see in the next couple of years whether any of those bullfrogs made it, but that certainly was the reasoning. We certainly don't need a spread of invasive species in Grand Teton National Park. And I think Grand Teton National Park realized that these animals weren't providing any particular benefit and they posed a risk. So might as well be safe rather than sorry. Hopefully that answers that question for you. Let's see what we got here. Oh, Toya, that's a great question. Outside of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park, are there other places or national parks that inspire your art? For those of you guys who don't know, when I am not being a wildlife biologist, I'm actually an artist as well here in town, most primarily in the medium of ceramics. I'm a professional potter as well. I am greatly inspired by wildlife in the national parks. Gee, I wonder why, because I'm a giant animal nerd, right? But I do love landscapes all over the world. I've illustrated everything from deserts and cities on my ceramics to the Grand Canyon, Zion. I have a lot of great loves, but when I oftentimes can, when there's not COVID going on, I love to escape to the desert. And I find desert landscapes particularly intriguing in ceramics. So 99.9% .9 of what I make is uh, definitely Grand Teton, Yellowstone, wildlife oriented, lots of moose but uh, I do enjoy illustrating desert landscapes as well. So that's pretty cool, Toya, thanks for that one. Let's see here. Linda says, will you continue these presentations for the rest of the winter? We plan to, unless, um, you know, there's some reason that we wouldn't. Uh, the, some of the things, of course, that are on our end, it's not exactly zero dollars to produce and make these. They do cost money, um, obviously, we're a small business, and so we've got to make sure that it certainly makes sense to do it, which is why I ask you guys to like and share these when you can. Uh, but yeah, we're enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. We hope to certainly continue them in the future. Toy asks, do the harlequin ducks stay in Yellowstone year-round? No, they don't. They migrate to the Pacific coast, generally Oregon coast, uh, although they can go to Washington, and they're only there in uh, the spring, summer, fall. So they've already left for the season. We'll miss them, but it's always fun to see them come back. Kevin asks, what would a bear den look like? Is it a cave or something else? Bears can den in caves. That's certainly something they could use. Most bear dens, when it comes to grizzlies and black bears, because other bear types might be, are, are different, are gonna be on preferably steep northern facing slopes. 
The idea being they can dig a relatively small hole, which will then fill with snow, but if the slope is steep enough, it won't fill completely, which will cause this nice insulative layer, but leave a little breathing hole uh, so that they can continue to maintain hibernation without having um, high, high carbon dioxide levels in the den. Uh, and it'll be just a tiny bit bigger than the bear itself. Uh, I think I've said before, uh, in these question and answer sessions, I've gone and I've looked at a couple different dens and crawled inside them over the years. Always, always when it's A, the dead of summer and I know the bear's not around and B, when I'm pretty sure that the, the bear den or wolf den or whatever it is I'm crawling in has not been used for several seasons. I don't want it to smell like people, right? If they want to reuse it, I don't want to keep them from doing it. So when I'm really, really sure it's no longer being used anymore, I've investigated a couple of them. I am not a small person, but I'm definitely smaller than a grizzly bear, and I can barely fit in these bear tents. So how they're able to squeeze in is beyond me. And um, some folks have been asking about 399 and those quadruplets, how they're all going to fit. Well, they're going to have to dig a bigger den for sure. So great question. I just said Brad Pitt's six pack is unhealthy. It is. There you have it, guys and gals. You can aim for perfection, but it's still vestigial. Heard from a biologist. <laughs> Hopefully I made some of you laugh on that one. Let's see here. All right, I think I got everybody's question. If I missed your question, just let me know in the comments section. I'll see if I can't get you an answer. I did want to wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving from your friends at Jacksonville Eco Tour Adventures. We are so appreciative that you spend your time on Wednesdays with us. We hope that you guys all have a great day tomorrow, a great week, a wild week. You stay safe out there, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week. So long.